Welcome everybody. <coughs> the first presentation is about the long-term effects of ayahuasca on psychopathologic symptomatology by Deborah González. Deborah. Good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. Buenas tardes. I will ask for permission to do this presentation in Spanish and Mark will translate the presentation in, in English with his marvelous voice because I'm sure that you will understand much better the, the, this, this study, the presentation of this study. Tin, tin. El ser humano tiene una capacidad innata de superar conflictos y autorregularse emocionalmente. Human beings we have an innate capacity to overcome traumatic experiences and self-regulate ourselves emotionally. Sin embargo, cuando vemos los datos epidemiológicos, observamos que en los países desarrollados el 14% de las personas sufren depresión. But when we check the epidemiological uh, data from developed countries, we see that 14% of population suffer from depression. El 10% algún trastorno relacionado con la ansiedad. 10% they suffer some uh, disorder related to anxiety. Alrededor del 7% sufren duelo complicado tras la muerte de un ser querido. About 7% suffer complicated grief due to the death of a loved one. Y el 6,8% de la población en América ha sufrido algún episodio de estrés postraumático a lo largo de su vida. And 6.8% of American population has suffered an episode of post-traumatic stress disorder in their lives. Estos datos reflejan la necesidad de buscar nuevas, nuevas herramientas terapéuticas y desarrollar nuevos protocolos de intervención para no prolongar estos problemas en las siguientes generaciones. This data suggests that we need to look for new treatment methods so we no longer uh, elongate the suffering in people. Por esta razón, la Fundación ICERS, en colaboración con la Beckley Foundation, desarrollaron un, pro un proyecto de investigación para evaluar los efectos terapéuticos de la ayahuasca a largo plazo en los problemas que hemos mencionado antes. This is why the ISIS Foundation, together with uh, the Beckley Foundation, we developed a program to uh, assess, to, to research the therapeutic effects of ayahuasca on the matters that I previously said. Y parte del diseño de esta investigación conllevaba comparar nuestros resultados con un grupo control en lista de espera. And part of this research was uh, to compare this population with a control group that was people waiting for uh, uh, being accepted to go to the, to the retreat center. El Temple of the Way of Light, un centro ubicado en Iquitos que trabaja con esta medicina bajo la tradición Chipibo, nos puso todos los recursos disponibles para que pudiéramos hacer el estudio allí. The Temple of the Way of Light, it's a retreat center near Iquitos that works with the Chipibo tradition. They supplied all, of the, all what we needed to start with this research. Y nos permitió evaluar a los visitantes que acudían a un retiro de 15 días donde tomaban ayahuasca ocho veces durante la noche. So they allowed us to evaluate the participants that would uh, take part in a 15-day retreat in which they would use ayahuasca eight days. Para realizar las evaluaciones, eh, utilizamos una plataforma online que se llama Lime Survey que permite almacenar los datos de forma segura. For this research, you used an online um, platform called Lime Survey that allows us to store the data in a safe way. Para evaluar el grupo experimental, se utilizó, bueno, se siguió esta línea de tiempo. So for the experimental group, this is the timeline that we followed. Los 
datos en base line, en page line, se evaluaron 15 días antes de llegar al templo, cuando la gente estaba en su casa. So baseline data was collected 15 days before attending the, the retreat when they were home. Y la evaluación posterior se realizó 15 días después de salir del Temple of the Way of Light, cuando la gente volvía a su casa de nuevo. And the afterwards evaluation was taken 15 days after people came back from the retreat center. Para comparar, para com, para contrastar la estabilidad de los resultados a lo largo del tiempo, se realizó un seguimiento a los tres, seis y doce meses de los participantes. And to check the consistency of the effects and the findings, we also compared with uh, three months later, six months, and a year after. El grupo control de lista de espera estaba conformado por las personas que realizan el booking al menos con dos meses de antelación antes de llegar al centro. The control group was created by people that uh, were, were booking the retreats at least two months in advance because of, uh, before the time that they wanted to go to the retreat center. Y la primera evaluación se realiza dos meses antes de llegar al centro cuando están en su casa. And the first evaluation is two months before when they are home. Y la segunda evaluación 15 días antes de acudir al centro cuando todavía están en su casa. And the second evaluation 15 days before they go to the center when they still home. De esta forma, en ambos grupos hay un rango de tiempo de un mes y medio y los resultados pueden ser comparables. Therefore, in both groups you have a time lapse of 1.5 months, so the results can be compared. Las áreas que evaluamos en este estudio fue la calidad de vida utilizando un cuestionario desarrollado por la Organización Mundial de Salud. De so la what, salud. what we evaluated was the quality of life evaluated with a World Health Organization questionnaire. Evaluamos psicopatología general utilizando el Symptom Assessment 45. Uh, we assessed uh, general psychopathology with the SA45 questionnaire. Util eh, evaluamos también la flexibilidad psicológica utilizando el Experimental Avoidance eh, Questionnaire. We also researched the psychological flexibility and experiential avoidance with the Avoidance uh, Questionnaire. Y también la capacidad para observar los propios sentimientos y, y emociones de una forma desapegada, utilizando la escala EQ de Centering. And also we uh, assess the capacity of observe our own thoughts and emotions for a less center point of view using the Centering Questionnaire. Y para evaluar eh, en aquellos problemas que podían estar causados por un trauma como el duelo complicado o como el estrés postraumático, utilizamos una escala que se llama Centrality of Heaven Scale que permite evaluar la integración del trauma en la propia identidad. And to research the uh, experiences with traumatic impact, we use this questionnaire, the centrality of traumatic event that allows you to see how important that event is in the life of the person. Para cada uno de los problemas y de los grupos que evaluamos, utilizamos una variable principal que pasaré a comentar en la sección de resultados. And for all the groups, we used a, a main a variable that I will tell you later about. Los, los datos del estudio longitudinal fueron analizados utilizando eh, la prueba T de Student para muestras apareadas. So the results, they were checked with the PERT uh, uh, student test. T test. Yeah, T test Esta prueba permite comparar los resultados de una misma persona consigo mismo en los diferentes intervalos de tiempo. And this allows you to compare the results of the same person with their own results in a lapse of time. Bien. Los datos demográficos que aquí eh, aparecen pertenecen a una muestra de 204 participantes que, conformada por los cuatro grupos experimentales eh, en baseline, en la evaluación baseline. So the demographic data, you see that we have 204 subjects, they belong to four demographic uh, aspects that they, they come from the baseline group. Como podéis ver aquí, en la muestra estaba conformada por personas de ambos sexos. You can see people from both genders. La mayoría de ellos de raza caucásica. Most of them Caucasian. Con una media de edad de 37 años. An average age of 37 years. Un alto nivel educativo high educational level y que no pertenecían a ningún grupo religioso and that they did not belong, uh, belong to any specific religious group. Los datos clínicos muestran que 
el 60% de estas personas habían acudido a terapia para, para tratarse su problema concreto en el pasado. Clinical data shows that 60.1% of these people they had gone to therapy prior to, to the retreat to assess those psychological uh, issues. Y el 36% de las personas habían tomado medicación para tratar su problema emocional. And 36% of people they had taken medication to treat those issues. Y solamente el 33% de toda la muestra era la primera vez que tomaba ayahuasca en este caso. And only the 33% of the population was actually the first time that they were going to be trying ayahuasca. Bien, aquí están los datos eh, que hemos obtenido con el eh, Beck Anxiety in the Inventory en una muestra de 31 personas. These are the results that we obtained from a sample of 31 volunteers with the Beck Anxiety Inventory. En la columna roja de la izquierda eh, podéis ver los datos en el base, en la, en baseline. The red column is the baseline data. Esta puntuación representa un nivel clínico moderado de ansiedad. This, uh, result is a moderate level of anxiety. Y en la evaluación posterior, 15 días después de salir del templo, el nivel de ansiedad desciende hasta un nivel mínimo de ansiedad que se prolonga durante los tres meses posteriores. And 15 days after the retreat, the anxiety levels decrease to a minimal level of, level of anxiety that remains stable for the next three months. Estos resultados muestran que este descenso en la ansiedad no se debe a un cambio en los, factor, en los factores contextuales al viajar a Perú y estar de retiro. This proves that the, the changes in the anxiety results, they do not, be, they are not caused because of the contextual changes, because of the fact of uh, traveling to Peru and, or going somewhere else. Sino que se mm, refiere más a un cambio personal o interno que se mantiene ante las mismas circunstancias adversas que antes provocaban la ansiedad. But that it belongs, uh, it, it's because of an internal change that remains stable even in the same circumstances that the person was living before. Para evaluar el duelo, los niveles de duelo, to assess grief levels, utilizamos la escala que se llama Texas Grief Inventory. We use this scale that's called Texas Grief Inventory. Esta escala, este cuestionario tiene dos escalas, una que permite evaluar los sentimientos de dolor en el pasado cuando la persona falleció. This scale has, has two different scales. One allows to measure the amount of uh, pain when the person died back then in that moment. Y una escala que se refiere al nivel de dolor que sientes en el momento en el que estás rellenando el cuestionario. And another scale that refers to the level of pain that you're experiencing at the moment of filling in the questionnaire. Como podéis ver en esta gráfica, la columna naranja representa el nivel de dolor que sintieron cuando la persona falleció en el pasado. As you can see, the, the orange column here represents the pain that they experienced back then when the person originally died. Y la columna roja representa la, la, el nivel de dolor que experimenta la persona en la evaluación basal 15 días antes de que llegaran al templo. And the red column uh, shows the level of pain that they suffered in the moment of filling the questionnaire 15 days before going to the retreat. Y como veis, las diferencias son mínimas a pesar de que en muchos de los casos la persona había fallecido muchos años atrás. And as you can see the difference between these two columns they are minimal even if uh, usually many years had happened before uh, since the person originally died. Y sin embargo, después de asistir a estos retiros del del templo y tomar ayahuasca, la, el nivel de dolor disminuye significativamente. But as you can see, after participating in the uh, ayahuasca retreat, the, these pain levels they decrease significantly. Y para evaluar los efectos de la ayahuasca en el estrés postraumático, and to evaluate the effects of ayahuasca in uh, post-traumatic stress, utilizamos la escala de trauma de Davidson. We use Davidson trauma scale. Esta escala permite evaluar la severidad y la frecuencia de los síntomas característicos del estrés postraumático. This scale allows you to, to see the uh, levels of post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of severity and frequency. Como las pesadillas, la reactividad emocional o los pensamientos intrusivos. Such as nightmares, emotional reactivity or intrusive thoughts. Y como veis en el, los gráficos, tanto la severidad como la frecuencia de estos síntomas descienden significativamente después de tomar ayahuasca también. And as you can see in these graphics, those levels they also decrease significantly after uh, drinking ayahuasca. 
Por último, para evaluar los síntomas depresivos, utilizamos el cuestionario Beck Depression Inventory. En el último, para medir los síntomas depresivos, utilizamos el Beck Depression Inventory. La columna de roja de la izquierda representa un nivel de depresión moderada antes de llegar al Temple of the Way of Light. The red column represents a moderate level of depression before going to the retreat center. Y después de volver del centro, el nivel de depresión desciende hasta un nivel mínimo. And as you can see, after coming back from the retreat center, the depression level decreases to a minimum. Estos resultados han sido bastante sorprendentes para nosotros porque la muestra no es muy grande y las diferencias son muy importantes. These results have been surprising for us because the, the um, number of subjects that we have is not too large, but the, the changes, the variation is very significant. Bueno, I think that maybe it's too much uh, uh, talk about the qualitative reports because of my, my partners. So, uh, I will try to conclude eh, <laughs> que esto es, este estudio muestra el gran potencial que tiene la ayahuasca para tratar la sintomatología emocional. This study shows the great potential that ayahuasca has in treating the emotional uh, symptomatology. Y me alude un poco a la capacidad que tiene esta ayahuasca, la, la ayahuasca para eh, autorregularnos emocionalmente y adaptarnos mejor al entorno. And it shows how ayahuasca can help us self-regulate emotionally in a better way and be more adapted to the, our environment. Solamente decir gracias al equipo de ICERS y la Beckley Foundation. I want to thank the team in ICERS and the Beckley Foundation. Y especialmente al Temple of the Way of Light, a aquellos participantes que han, que han asistido al estudio y a todas las personas que lo han soportado económicamente. Especially to the Temple of the Way of Light and all the participants, of course, and all the people that supported this project financially. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Deborah, and uh, thank you also, uh, Mark, for your translation. Now, uh, Irene Pérez is going um, to talk about the long-term effects of ayahuasca in Western users. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Irene Perez, and I'm currently living and working in the Temple of the Way of Light, uh, an ayahuasca retreat center near Iquitos, Peru. But I'm also collaborating with ICERS in the development of the study that Deborah just present. And so it's a pleasure for me to display for you the results on the well-being area of the, um, of the study. Um, I would like to share with you um, a few words about the structure and procedures of the study for you to understand what I want to explain later. It's similar to what Deborah um, explained. So we need the participants to fill different surveys before and after the experience with ayahuasca. And so when they leave the temple, we send them surveys 15 days after, uh, three months, six months, and a year. Um, so we are presenting here the data that we process until now in the well-being area, and this means the 15-day control and the three months follow-up. So to get started, let's take a quick look into some demographic data. As you can see, around the 60% of participants are male and 14 is female. The average age is 14, 40 years old. Uh, almost 80% has high, high studies, almost uh, no, 80, 87% is Caucasian, and, and the 95% is non-religious, and 40% is first-time users. Um, before diving into the results, I want to explain a few things about the graphics for everyone, everyone to have an, an easy understanding. So, 
the first blue that you that you saw, uh, the first blue column uh, shows the data for the participants before uh, working with the plant. Uh, and as Deborah said, for the comparison, we use the paired samples t-test, and this means that we compare the 15 days control with the baseline and the three months control follow-up also with the, with the ba baseline for each participant. And, and the asterisk will show us uh, the significance of the, of the results. So the first data I'm, gonna, I'm going to present, as you can see in the screen, is the results about uh, the quality of life. And here you can see different scales as physical health, psychological, social relationships, and environment. Um, this was designed also for the World Health Organization. And so observing the results and the 15-day control and, and three months, we see uh, that they increase in a significant way. And although we see a little decrease in the three-month follow-up, uh, when we compare it to the baseline, the, significant, uh, the results is still, still significant. So to exemplify what, what this means, I would like to share with you a report for one of the participants. And this person says, uh, I am more healthy than I was before. I have stopped drinking alcohol and caffeine for the time being. I practice yoga and meditate every day. My personal relationships are going through huge and important changes. The most important changes have been in the way I relate to myself. I seem more comfortable in my own skin than I have in a long while. So the next scale I, I scale I want to show you, called the centering, measures the, the ability to observe one's thoughts and feelings in a detached way, the capacity to understand that we are not what we think or what we feel. Uh, and this ability is a core piece in most of the traditions that consider meditation as an important tool of awareness. And as, as you can see, we, can, we found a, a, a very significant improvement in the 15 days post-evaluation, but also, as we, if we compare it again with the baseline, the, 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 the improvement is very significant in the three months, no? So, and again, to illustrate what, what does it feel in the participants, I will share with you this other report. I return home with a greater self, sense of present moment awareness and consequently have found it so plainly straightforward to acknowledge the rise of stress reactions at le and let them pass before fully manifesting. In other words, I have become more aware to my unconscious thoughts, feelings, and actions, and now find it much easier to operate consciously. Yeah, so this, this graphic shows us the psychological well-being and as you can see here, different areas, no? Autonomy, environmental mastery, personal growth, positive relation, relations, um, purpose in life, self-acceptance. And again, we can see how the, how the improvement, no? In, in all of them uh, is, is significant. Um, so maybe I, I think that we all can agree, no, and how, how important these areas can, can be uh, in relation of the maturity of the, of the person and the, um, and the, and the improvement on, of, of, of life. And so let's, let's hear this other report that, that uh, illustrates that. I feel that my usual way of hiding away from troublesome aspects of my life has been eradicated. I feel very in touch with my emotions. This is, of course, very painful sometimes since I had good reason to shut off my emotions to begin with. It's not that the medicine has eradicated my health psychological problems like, ha like I had hope. It's more than that, it has shown me what I need to do in order to get better. So it's a starting point, not an, an end. I feel empowered. Also, I know that everything is actually okay, even though I never get better. Everything is perfect, but I feel empowered to deal with my issues. So here, the next graphic uh, shows the results on, on happiness. 
Um, and as you can see, the, the improvement is, is very significant here, no? Again, the, the, the level in the baseline and the level in the three months follow-up, for example, is, is very significant. And yeah, so we can see how after three months of experience, the level of feeling of happiness is positive. And I give you another, another example with this, with this report. I feel that my personal relationships uh, have changed and therefore I feel more connection to the world at large. I have become very comfortable and aware of being totally responsible for my life and therefore feel can navigate life better which helps me when life is challenging. I could look at all things, emotions, people, relationships and so on from a different perspective which open more ways of solving problems or accept things I could not accept before. I have much better relationship with myself. I love who I am and I'm really happy with who I am. I never really been able to say that before. I feel more connected to the people around me and I have a better direction in my life. And I think that this, this report really shows no, what, what this means. And last but not least, I want to show you the results on spirituality uh, that also is, is designed by the World Health Organization. If you remember when I presented demographic data, uh, more than 90% of the participants choose the non-religious option. But obviously, this doesn't mean that there is no sense of connection to something bigger than us or, or, or the longing for life meaning. Um, as you can perceive in the graphics, all, all areas are improved and in all areas the, the, the increase and, and the result is, is significant. No spiritual connection, meaning and purpose in life, experience of awe and wonder, wholeness, integration, spiritual strength, inner peace, hope and optimism and faith. And so for you to understand how people felt that, I'm, I'm going to read this last, this last report. I feel much more connected to my true self and I know how important it is to follow my heart and live without fear. I feel more confident in myself that things will be all right as long as I trust the process and follow my heart. I don't have to have all the answers right now, but they will, sh they will be shown to me along the way. And so, as a, as a conclusion, uh, with the data that we had collected until now and, and using the tools designed for the World Health Organization, we can prove that, that ayahuasca improves the quality of life, personal growth, happiness, and spirituality, and that this, that this improvement endure for three months. Um, we truly believe that these results can prove the need for decriminalized ayahuasca as a drug, the need to remove the stigma that the different body drug control has put on this medicine, and of course, nevertheless, it's necessary to continue gathering data and dem that demonstrates its, thera its therapeutic effectiveness in the, with the appropriate scientific methodology. And so we really want to keep going with the study and we are really passionate about, we have faith in our work and we have the certainty that a positive, a positive future for ayahuasca and the shamanic practices is possible and we want to be part of it. So to make that possible, we would love to, to keep increasing the participation or with those that are coming to the temple, uh, find new, new ways to support the study and, and see how the research on ayahuasca in, increases with, with new studies. And so to close my, my talk, I want to express my appreciation to all the, all the team from the study for all the work and dedication uh, for all the, the support that we received from Berkeley, Berkeley Foundation. And as Deborah said, no, it's, it's need to express our gratitude to the Temple of the Way of Light and the amazing work that they are doing in Iquitos, especially to Matthew Watterson, its founder, for the trust and willingness uh, to collaborate with us and make it possible. And I want to express my gratitude especially to my, my colleagues and dear friends, Ben de Lunen and, and Deborah Gonzalez to, have, to give me the opportunity for, to do this this work and to be in this project. And of course, thank you for everyone for coming and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. 
The next speaker is um, Tania Mate, who will um, talk about of the ayahuasca uh, integration experience. The word is yours. Good. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to leave Irene's beautiful last slide up. <laughs> I made one, but we can't get it off my Mac, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, so I want to start by expressing some gratitude uh, first to the indigenous people of Rio Branco for having us on their land, uh, to Ben and Bia and the whole ICERS team for putting on this amazing conference. Um, so my name is Tanya Mate. I come from Finnish, Irish, and Ukrainian descent with a strong Hungarian influence. Uh, and I'm the integration director for the Temple of the Way of Light. So, I mean, these results are incredible, like really, really, really incredible. Uh, and it's a great honor to be working with the temple. Uh, so my job is to talk to people before they go and after they come back. Uh, so I'm primarily based out of Vancouver, Canada. And I talk to people on Skype from around the world, most days, all day, uh, either before they come down to the temple to help them prepare, uh, sometimes to screen them. So in collaboration with ICRs, we've developed a really comprehensive medical and psychological screening process that people go through in order to apply to come to the retreats. Uh, and then if there's any gray area, basically if anybody has any psychological anything on their forms, I do an actual 20-minute Skype call with them just to kind of assess their readiness and see if they're ready to come down. Uh, and then I do follow-up care. So I do group calls and I do one-on-one -on -one calls with people uh, and then I do email support and we have a team of integration specialists, therapists, people who've been through it with ayahuasca themselves that are also available to support people. Uh, and then I've also worked with Dr. Gabor Mate, who happens to be my father-in-law, and I've trained with him in his kind of unique style of processing and integration. And I do follow-up care with people that come through those retreats as well. Uh, so I've seen a lot of people and a lot of the stuff that they go through, and, and I want to talk just about some of the common challenges that I see people face. So this hasn't been studied yet, but it's, there's definite themes emerging in the kinds of things that people deal with afterwards. And I'm really coming from a place of wanting to maximize healing. So it's not just crisis management, it's not just intervention in the case of people who really need it or need support, but I really want everybody to get support after their ayahuasca experiences. And I'm also coming from a place of using ayahuasca in a therapeutic context. Um, Personal development as well. You know, healing and spirituality are not really separate things. So, uh, <laughs> it's it's important to support people, uh, but I really want to help maximize their healing. Uh, I'm trained as a naturopathic doctor, so I'm also coming from a clinical background. So a lot of my focus is on mental health stuff, and I kind of speak through a lens of looking at things in terms of mental health, but personal development, spirituality, healing, they're all ultimately the same thing. Uh, and just a couple more thank yous, one to Gabor for giving me his blessing to continue this work, and one to Matthew Watherston, the owner-founder of the temple, for also giving me his trust to speak on behalf of the temple here. Uh, and to the Shipibo people, uh, all my experiences in ceremony with the Shipibo tradition. I don't have other experiences, I haven't taken ayahuasca in a pill, and I haven't sat in a daime ceremony, so this is where I'm coming from. Um, so. One way of thinking about chronic illness is thinking about it as a reflection of a compensatory internal belief system. So something happens, uh, and this is the definition of trauma that we work from, is not whatever it is that happened, but the disconnect from yourself that happened as a result of whatever that thing was. So something happens early in childhood, you get disconnected from yourself, you get disconnected from spirit, and then you develop some sort of belief system about yourself. And then you view the world through this lens of this belief system, and subconsciously you design your whole environment through the lens of this belief system. And then people come on an ayahuasca retreat, and they are in a group of people who become like family, and they get connected to themselves, and they experience ceremony, and then they go home. <laughs> and it's the same environment that it was when they left. And anyone who's been on, say, a three-month backpacking trip can even relate to this. You know, you go away and you have this really profound experience and you can't wait to go home and tell all your friends about it, and you get home and everybody is exactly the same as when you left. And the question becomes, how do you stay connected to yourself? How do you stay connected to the teachings of the medicine when the environment is set up to bring you back to who you were before you left? Um, So I, a personal example, uh, just about the way that I designed my own environment subconsciously. So I lived for a long time in the downtown east side in Vancouver. Uh, anyone who's read Gabor's addiction book um, maybe knows a little bit about this neighborhood, but it's a, 
It's a neighborhood with a really, really high concentration of drug addicted, uh, homeless, and mentally ill people. Um, it's, a, it's a few block radius with 1,500 homeless people and a lot of support services. That's where the safe injection site is located. Um, and I lived in that neighborhood for almost 10 years, and I didn't have you know, outright addictions. Everybody has addictions, everybody has trauma, but I was drawn to that neighborhood because there was something I needed to learn about myself. Subconsciously, that environment reflected my internal landscape, and once I did several years of healing work, I, I was no longer <laughs> required to live there, and it was time to move on, but it was a reflection of what was going on inside, and it took a lot of effort conscious work on my part to make my environment more reflective of what's actually going on inside me now. Um, so another, another challenge is that people come to ayahuasca and they experience this really rapid growth, this really rapid shift in their self-concepts and their personal values and their connections and in what is important to them. So it becomes about managing quick change as well. Um, so what happens on the retreat that causes this shift in internal belief systems? So one of the things that happen is people have these mystical or spiritual or awakening type experiences. Uh, and this is something that, you know, with meditation or with therapy can take many, many, many years to achieve and people read about it and talk about it and hope for it to happen. On one ayahuasca retreat, some people might have many, many moments of these kinds of experiences. And this can be a really powerful reference point. And this is something I talked about in my workshop the other day, this reference point of something greater than yourself, of, of moving beyond your mind and who you thought you were, like Irene said, uh, this is a really powerful reference point for healing, but it can also come with this kind of, uh, what Mark called the other day, uh, state-specific memory, or what's sometimes talked about in, in spirituality is uh, abiding versus non-abiding awakening, or the I got it, I lost it phenomenon. So you go into ceremony and you have this really beautiful transcendent experience and then you wake up the next day and you feel like the same person you were. And there can be this kind of loss of <laughs> what happened, where did it go? Um, the community is a really, really important aspect of what happens on the retreats. So this is different from using ayahuasca in a clinical context, but when people come on retreat and they connect with people as themselves, so when their coping mechanisms, their beliefs get stripped away and they're actually in an environment with other people where they get to express themselves authentically, perhaps for the first time, this is really powerful. And being in the presence, being witnessed by other people becomes a really powerful uh, strengthening or resourcing for them to go back into the world. But when they go back into the world and that community doesn't exist, this can be a problem. Uh, the ritual and ceremony cannot be undervalued. Uh, to me, this is a very, very, very important piece of the work. And you know, these studies are all done in the context of an entire system of Shipibo healthcare, of shamanic healthcare. So it's not just the ayahuasca, but it's the ceremony and the spirits and the other plants that are being used. And in a lot of Western culture, we don't have anything like this. People don't have a lot of ritual or a lot of spirituality. Um, so this, this whole piece of it is very important. And, and the revaluing of what's important. So again, when people get stripped of their coping mechanisms, their belief systems, things just don't seem as appealing as they used to. So you see this with people who come for addiction treatment, uh, or you see this with people who used to like a certain kind of music and they don't anymore. There is a shift in the way that people relate to things. So maybe pizza, pizza used to be really, really good and they go home and they just don't have the same interest in anymore. Maybe cocaine used to be really, really good and they go home and they just don't have the same interest in it anymore. And this happens really quickly. Uh, this can happen with relationships as well. There's a massive purging of old traumas. And again, trauma is not necessarily what happened, but the disconnect from yourself that happened as a result of that and the, the energetic blocks that got put in place to make that disconnect there. So the work that the maestros, the shamans are doing, the work that's happening with the ayahuasca is removing those blocks and purging those old traumas. So again, people might go home and not really know how to relate to the rest of the world because they feel completely different than they ever have. They're much lighter energetically. Um, and then this, Joe talked about this in his talk the other day, so I'm gonna use your words, the reconnecting with the emotional body. And this is a really important piece of it because for me, this is a way to communicate uh, what happens on an ayahuasca retreat is really speaking in the language of emotions. Everybody can relate to emotions. Not everybody can feel emotions, but everybody can relate to emotions. And 
developing a language, developing a way to speak about your experiences helps increase that community, helps decrease a sense of isolation, and helps people stay connected to the work in a practical and a grounded way. Um, there's the work of the maestros and the facilitators and this really beautiful transference that happens in ceremony and in the context of a retreat. So sometimes you go into a ceremony and you revisit an old memory from childhood or you have a traumatic experience and the trauma includes the disconnect that happens uh, as a result of whatever happened. It also includes being alone with that thing, whatever that event was. So maybe there was some abuse, maybe something happened. If that small child doesn't have anybody to talk to about it, it becomes traumatic. It reinforces that disconnect. And so in ceremony, there's these helpers and there's these maestros that can help rewire your brain. So you can actually, on a very deep level, not just with the help of the medicine and not just with the help of your witnessing of yourself, but actual people there that can help rewire your brain, can help your nervous system imprint, resonate with something healthy and safe. Uh, and then there's this really nice super plastic state of your brain that happens because of the extra serotonin. So with all this other stuff that's happening, this transference, the spirits, everything like that, there's also this increased capacity to make new neuronal connections. So these habits that are automatic, these coping mechanisms that are automatic, I give an example of a, a superhighway. So it's like something happens, you automatically go down the superhighway. If something happens, you automatically do this thing every single time and there's no other choice. Uh, in ceremony, something that can happen is all of a sudden there's this new pathway that gets made and it can be very thin at first. Sometimes I compare it to just a jungle path. So all of a sudden there becomes a choice and the work of integration is about choosing that other path. When before there was no choice, now there's actually another road to go down, but the, it requires effort, it requires work. Okay. So the specific challenges, I kind of wove those in a little bit, but the lack of community is a really, really important one. And Mark said this the other day too, if, if we had communities, we wouldn't need integration. And I really like that, it's, it's true. Um, another really common thing that I see, and this is something that people tend to require a lot of support with, is a continued purging process. So maybe people get in touch with fear or sadness or anger or something and then it takes three months or it takes six months and this anger is still coming out. So it doesn't necessarily all get purged in that one ceremony but it continues to clear out for the next three, six months. Uh, and sometimes all people need is just a reminder that that's what's happening. Um, but it can happen and it can go on and it can be really challenging for them. Uh, the uncovering of hidden trauma is a, a common thing that happens. So people will come and they say they think they don't have any trauma and then they have a ceremony experience and you know maybe the specific details of it are important, maybe they're not, but the emotional experience of it is really important. And so people get in touch with these emotional memories of fear or anger or pain or shame and didn't know that they were there. So finding a way to navigate that, finding a way to bring the mind on board so that this can be healed. Um, there can be a sense of urgency to get through everything really quickly. This is a kind of a trauma response where people are just like, if I just feel the pain all of it right now, then I'll feel better. And this can actually be re-traumatizing. So encouraging people to slow down, encouraging people to take their time. Um, another thing that I see a lot is people think that they should be further ahead than they are. <laughs> and they're really hard on themselves. And then I should know this already. I should be healed by now. Uh, so again, just reminding them that where they are is perfect. Um, yeah, these are, these are the most common things that I see. Some of the ways to approach this, uh, developing community, again, community, 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 uh, is a really important thing. Uh, and then developing language. So this speaking about things in terms of emotions. So people go and they have these really powerful experiences and they're with a group of people where it's safe to talk about, you know, riding an eagle to the moon and realizing how powerful you are and, and this really beautiful, elaborate vision. But if you come home into the world and you start talking like that, people might think you're crazy. You might not connect. And it might actually be damaging to that person to talk about their experiences in that way because if it's not received well, it can reinforce old patterns. So speaking about things first in the language of emotions. So if this person flew an eagle to the moon and realized their own power, the important message in that is that they felt powerful. They felt a lack of shame, say, for the first time. Everybody can relate to that. So really finding ways to keep the language emotional at first and, and feeling out how safe it is to speak about the more elaborate things. Um, promoting some sort of ceremony, ritual, or practice as part of daily life. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a seated meditation. 
It could be a tobacco practice, smoking, it could be going for a walk in the woods. Nature's a really important piece of this, but some kind of way to stay connected to ceremony in your daily life. Um, and then there's the question of just approaching changes in work, in relationships, in all aspects of the environment that was subconsciously designed, like I started talking about. So finding ways to actually make the environment consistent with the authentic self, consistent with the person that you are now that you've done this healing work. Uh, so these are some of the questions. You know, we don't, I don't have all the answers. Uh, this is a very new field. Uh, you know, there are some people who have been doing integration work underground for a long time, but it, specific to ayahuasca, it's still quite new. Um, so yeah, I, I invite conversation, I invite collaboration, and I would love to hear from you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tania. Uh, as next, um, Camila Berens. Um, present the uh, endoclassification of the Banisteropsis capi. So, hello, uh, my name is Camila Berens. I study biology at the University of Brasilia, and I'm here to tell a little bit about dialogue of knowledge, ethnoclassification of Banisteriopsis capi, and formal taxonomy. This project is being advised by Regina Célia de Oliveira, Maria Rita Ravansi, Julia Sonsin, and Sueli Maria Gomes, and is being supported by FAPDEF and University of Brasilia. So, for those who don't know, Banisteriopsis capi is one of the raw materials utilized to the preparation of ayahuasca, and is a divine. It's a liana that basically is a wood vine, and there are many, many types of lianas recognized by religious groups, but there is no formal systematization of these types. So, what we want is to register in a systematized way the different types of the Banisteriopsis capiliana ethnically recognized by religions that drink ayahuasca in and around the federal district of Brazil. We want to understand the criteria and the groupings of this ethno classification and to integrate this knowledge with formal science. The area of research is in and around federal district, as you can see in this map. And okay, uh, the first step to start this project was to schedule visit guide tours in different religious groups that, rely, that make use of ayahuasca and that prepare their own ayahuasca. So in the visit, we apply a semi-structured interview with the informants, and after this, we collect the biological sample collections. That is basically stem samples, leaves, flowers, and flower buds. But it was not always possible to collect these four basic materials because the first reason to collect the, flo the flowers, you have to schedule the visit in August because the period of flowering of Banisteriopsis cap in federal district is just in August and September. And the second reason is that the stand samples was cut for the religious groups only in ayahuasca ceremonies preparation. So I had to schedule all the visits in this period and it, was, it wasn't possible. All the material collected was referenced, photographed, recorded and incorporated into the Herbarium at the University of Brasilia. So after the field work, we took all the, all the material that we collected to the Department of Botany, which received different procedures to conserve, to different conservation procedures. The branch, for example, was pressed and prepared to be incorporated in the Herbarium at the University of Brasilia. The stands were sent to Professor Julia Sonsin and Gabriel to realize the wood anatomy. The leaves received two different procedures. Uh, the first one is to store the leaves in a bottle with a liquid called FAA to realize the, the study of, to promo, 
at the study of the leaf anatomy. And the second one is store the leaves in a bottle with silica to perform the study of the molecular part of the leaf. Uh, this is the bud flowers that we use to realize the cytogenetic study. And, uh, and at, through the cytogenetic study, we can, we can analyze the molecular of DNA of the plants. So it's important to emphasize that five different labs in the University of Brasilia are being benefited with our collection. And all the information, all the data from each collection are organized in a database and can be accessed by all the researchers and studies involved in this project. So, during this visit, basically there was mentioned 14 different types of lianas utilized to preparation of ayahuasca. And of those 14, we collected 10. They are Tucunacá, Mistério, Ourinho, Calpuri, Calpuri de Nolongo, Pajazinho, Quebrador, Pingo de Ouro, a hybrid liana, and a native liana, according to the informant. And among all types of lianas collected, we realized some patterns and some very contrasting differences between all of the collected, which allow us to divide them in two main groups. There is liana with inflated nodes and lianas with non-inflated nodes. The principal characteristics recognized by inform informants are stand format, stand malleability, bark pattern, glands, the presence or absence of glands, and the effect and color of the tea produced by certain lianas. So, as I said previously, we can produce different aspects in the tea according to the liana that we utilize to the preparation of the ayahuasca. So, Calpuri and Calpuri de Nolongo produce a strong drink in terms of effect and flavor, but with a more thin consistency compared to the drink produced with Ourinho and brings a lot of cleansing, vomiting. These informations are according to the informants. It's important to emphasize. Tucunacá and Ourinho, both lianas, produce sweet flavor with softer effect than with Calpuri. Ourinho drink consistently more viscous, like honey, and easier to obtain the sense since the stem is less hard. Caboquinho is a tea with a dark color, and Estrela is a tea that causes a lot of dysentery and produces drink with a red color. So as I say, we have two basic types of lianas with inflated nodes and those with non-inflated nodes. These pictures are about the stand samples that we collected with inflated nodes. We have Pajazinho, Calpuri, and Calpuri de Nolongo. And according to the informant, the characteristics that they utilize to make the distinction of these inflated nodes lianas are basically the nodes, because Pajazinho produces nodes during all the stem and during the roots, while Calpuri and Calpuri de Nolongo produce nodes only during the stand. And Calpuri de Nolongo produce a node longer than Calpuri, than normal Calpuri. So they utilize these characteristics to distinguish. And this is the non-inflated nodes. that we have Tucunacá, Quebrador, Pingo de Ouro, and Ourinho. Uh, according to the informants, they utilize some, some Different in fun characteristics to recognize each, each one. Tukunaka, for example, you can scratch the, the, the bark, and if the scratch becomes green, it's a tukunaka. And if, if the scratch becomes a white color, you can say that it's orinho. Orinho also has another characteristic that is the bark. The bark of Ourinho is easily loosened. So if you pass the finger or if you handle the, the stem, you will feel the, the easily loosened bark. Quebrador has a flexible stem. So if you try to, to break this liana, you will notice that it's not easy to, to break because it's something like a rubber that is flexible. 
and pingu de ouro can be recognized by the leaves because the leaves produce a golden glands, the, a golden glands in the back cell of the leaves. Well, in the flowers, we, we didn't notice uh, contrasting characteristics to make the distinction through the flowers. But what we noticed was that the flower of quebrador are pink, only pink, and the flowers of pingo de ouro and calpuri and tucunacá produce a white color and a pink flower. But according to a book called Flora Neutropica of, Bro of Browning Gates, the difference of color of the flowers indicate the age of the flower. So the old flowers produce a white color, white, uh, while the young flowers produce a pink color. So we need to collect more material to analyze and to understand this criteria. Yeah, well, we noticed that there is a large di diversity in the different kinds of lianas being cultivated in and around the federal district. And there are differences in the classification of the same type of lianas among the various groups that use cap lianas in the confection of ayahuasca. So we noticed that the diversity is very big and there are a lot of difference between the classification in different groups, but there are a lot of similarities. So the ethno classification is very important. There is a predominance in the cultivation of three main types in federal district. There is basically Calpuri, Tucunacá, and Ourinho. And we noticed a sign of hybridization occurring between the different types. So we found vines that, found lianas, sorry, of lianas that have the characteristics of Calpuri with plated nodes but has a bark easily loosened. So the same liana had the two different characteristics, characteristics, so it's a sign of hybridization. Um, the result shows that traditional knowledge is essential for study the characterization of the different types of lianas used to preparation of ayahuasca. And we need to amplify the information and the collection throughout the Americas, throughout federal district, Brazil, because we already know that a lot of countries, a lot of states make use of ayahuasca and prepare their own ayahuasca. So there are a lot of lianas, a lot of bunch stereoscopy is being cultivated in different countries. So it's very important to to know that this diversity this diversity to try to preserve the diversity of lianas of Banisteriopsis cap. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Haus, haus, muito grata. in Ayahuasca. Yes, exactly. So, um, hello to you all. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in this awesome conference and letting me be here talking about some wood anatomy and botany. So uh, this project is part of a larger project, as Camila have already said. Uh, I am going to talk about the emphasis that we put in the anatomy of the lianas used in the production of the tea. So let's get on with it. But firstly, what are lianas? Well, lianas, simply put, are woody vines, meaning that they do have bark, such as trees or any other plant that has bark, but they have this candid habit of, uh, of vines, meaning that they start the development into the ground, and as they develop further, they lose the ability to support themselves, meaning that they have to climb and rely on other vertical surfaces uh, in tropical forests being trees. You can see some lianas in this picture that I'm showing you here, but uh, I think these are better. 
So the first image I put there is to show you how good they are, how efficient they are in climbing trees and forming this co complex network of plants in the tree cups. They climb and twine around trees and even go to other trees to help the uh, climbing of them. The second image, as you can see, uh, shows the different shapes and forms that these lianas can, can have and that will uh, help them be more efficient in their climbing. The last image is going to show you how they have a bark that's very similar and has a resemblance to the bark of the tree that is climbing. Regarding the anatomy, lianas, as any other plant, have an anatomy that goes in relation to their habit. So they have a scandent habit, which means that they have to be flexible uh, because they need to twine and make all those moves uh, to be efficient at climbing the trees, not the surfaces, of course. Uh, they also need to have a very, string, uh, a very strength stem, very strong stem, I'm sorry. Uh, because they need to support the weight of their own bodies and bodies of all the lianas that might climb, uh, climb upon them. These plants are known to grow up to 100 meters, so you can imagine the weight that they have, so they need to be very strong. And also, they need to have a very efficient uh, conductive system, because the conductive system is going to take all the nutrients in the water that these plants need from the roots to the leaves and vice versa. So, do, uh, about the flexibility, they tend to invest in a higher quantity of axioparenchyma, which is uh, a tissue that is softer. So having a softer tissue in abundance might lead these plants to have more flexibility. In contrast, uh, fibers are not that they are neglected, but they have fewer uh, quantity if compared to regular wood, of course. Fibers are hard, so if they had much uh, fibers, much more fibers that they, ha that they already have, they would be able to support themselves a little bit more, but they would become too brittle. So that's not something that you want if you want to twine and make all those moves. Uh, to have more strength, hard and soft tissues are intermingled in the stem, and that helps them have more strength. These hard and soft tissues might be the, uh, the axoparenchyma being the soft and hard being the fibers, or they might have other tissues, for example, the phloem and exylum that I'm going to talk about more specifically later. The way the conduction cells are uh, present in the xylem and the phloem of these plants, and that is that if you have wider conduction cells, then you're going to have a more efficient conductive system, and that's precisely what they do. These characteristics, all of them summed up, form what is known as the liana scent vascular syndrome. Uh, you might want to recall the name later. As expected, these plants have roles that go in various ranges of areas. So, for example, they might have an ecological role, as you can see there, providing shelter and also food and also be acting as a means of mobilization and transport for various animals, such as mammals, birds, or even insects. But they might also have... Uh, uh, a role that is more eco uh, eco um, economical and social, being the raw material for handicraft and production of furniture in various communities. Uh, as talked about Scipioni, there is a community that relies basically on Netheropsis uh, lianas uh, for the production of those materials, as I said before. But they have, and that's the main point here, Another important role that is that they are the raw materials for the production of uh, ayahuasca. So Tukunaka and Kaupuri most precisely, which are the lianas I'm going to emphasize here. Because of the various uh, uses that these plants might have, they need to have very important and concise taxonomical research done to them. Because if you know, then you can control the quality and the veracity of these plants. Because of the widespread use and sale of these plants, how can you assure that the plants that you're buying are, in fact, the plants that you're seeking? So if you don't know the taxonomy, if you don't know the classification and a way to identify these plants, accidents might happen, leading into death even. Because if you try to produce a tea that's not with the plant that you're looking for, then what if that plant has some toxic uh, chemic, uh, chemic? So that's my, that might lead to death. And also to an extinction of these plants, and even extinction of cultures. Unfortunately, taxonomical researches are not very common nowadays. Tukunaka and Kaupuri are mainly the two lianas that are related in the scientific community. 
If you search, then you will feel and then you will find a neglect of other lianas that are known by traditional sources to be used in production of ayahuasca, but all, all neglected or very, uh, very little mentioned about them. So, and even Tukunakai and Kalpuri, they are the ones that are mentioned. There isn't a consensus in the scientific medium. Some people say that they are two species, two different species. Some people say that they are the same species. So there is not a consensus, and that might uh, be a problem later. So the objectives of this study and all other studies are to observe the anatomical features of these plants uh, from an anatomical point of view, of course, Kaupuri and Tukunaka being the two plants that we looked on, uh, to compare the traits between these two lianas, also to study the similarities of these plants, the similarities and differences, of course, and try to complement and to uh, enhance the knowledge in uh, an anatomical point of view. To do so, we gathered five samples of these plants, two of them being from Kaupuri and three of them being from Tukunaka. We identify them by the external morphology. Camila has already said about something about their external morphology, but I'm going to talk about it more now. Uh, Kaupuri has these circular nodes that are very uh, well, characteristic, so you can use that to identify these plants. And also, Tukunaka has uh, lobes, cylindrical lobes, are surrounding their stem. We collected two uh, Kaupuri from two different ayahuasca groups in Brasilia, and the Tokunaka, we collected three of them uh, from two plantations in one gallery forest in São João da Aliança. Both lianas were analyzed macro and microscopically following the Yawa list and also Angelosi. The results were somewhat expected in some areas, meaning that these plants have the liana centrovascular syndrome, as I mentioned before meaning that they have very wide vessels, as you can see in that image. Uh, those vessels are, are very characteristic traits of lianas. They also have more axial parenchyma than fibers. I'm going to show you later uh, that. And also cambio variants. Remember when I said the hard and soft tissues might be intermingled? Well, this is the case. The intercellular phloem is the, the mixture of hard and soft tissues, being xylem, the hard tissue, that commonly is made by the cambium, which will produce uh, xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside. But here, that doesn't happen this way. They do produce xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside, but there, also, there is a variant in the cambium that will produce the phloem to the inside, inside the xylem. That's uh, an important characteristic, and that is shown in the uh, white arrows, as you can see there. There were other features. Uh, for example, regarding the vessels, the vessels have a uh, vessel dimorphism that, that is uh, very more uh, notable, closer to the bark, as you can see there. And vessel dimorphism, as if you take a look at the red and uh, the red circles, as you can see there, there is larger and there are uh, smaller vessels side to side, and that's a very important characteristic to mention. Regarding the axial parenchyma, we found three types of axial parenchyma, meaning being them the scanty uh, uh, axial parenchyma, which is the black circle. Scanty means that there isn't, uh, or there isn't, or there is very little axial parenchyma surrounding the vessels. Uh, there is vasocentric, which is shown by the arrows, and vasocentric is the axial parenchyma that is completely surrounding the vessels, and there is also uh, irregular lines being formed by non-lignified axial parenchyma. Those irregular lines are also something to, uh, interesting to look at because they form only from a certain distance from the pith. And from that distance on, they start to grow larger and larger, forming these marginal bands, as you can see there. Prismatic crystals were also identified. Uh, the prismatic crystals are those thingies that are on the axial parenchyma, uh, those prisms, uh, and they do appear in the two uh, lianas that we found, that we observed. And there were also vested pits in the vessels. Pits are the way that vessels communicate and pass nutrients and water from one vessel to the other. And being, them being vestured, uh, that is of, uh, some sort of reinforcement in the, uh, in the pits is a very characteristic uh, and notable feature as well. All of these characteristics that I'm shown here are similarities, but they do have differences, and those differences are most precisely uh, the frequency and the 
size of the vessels, being Kalpuri having frequent narrower vessels, and Tukunaka having wider vessels, but with less abundancy. These two pictures are on the scale, so you can compare uh, the size and the frequency of these vessels. Regarding crystals, uh, Kalpuri has a large frequency of druses, which are crystals that look like stars. Uh, and they do happen in the intercellary form. They are uh, existent in the Tukunaka as well, but they are in a very smaller quantity, and they also come in small sizes. Uh, crystals cluster radially in the axobranchma, in that gradual organi organization, is something that only appears in Tukunaka, so that's another thing to look at. And lastly, the last difference is, to, uh, is regarding the parenchymatic series. That series is how many cells there are on top of one another, and inside that object that I put there in red, you can count the cells and see that Kaupori has two to four cells per axial parenchymatic strand, and Tukunaka has up to eight cells. That was the maximum that we could count. So, what can we say about uh, those differences and similarities. Well, these two lianas are indeed related because they share qualitative features, but they, th but they have some quantitative features that are not conclusive. You can say that they are two different species, but you can doubt because they have different quantitative data, they have cambio variants, they are different, they form different patterns, and that is not saying that t these two lianas are different, but they might be, be uh, differentiated in the future. That's why there is further research being done, not only by uh, an anatomical point of view, but as Camilla said, there are five labs working in this, so there will be more uh, in the future, there will be more conclusive um, conclusions. So I want to say some thanks to these people. Uh, they made this project possible and they were advising us uh, each step of the way. And also I want to thank each and every one of you for being here, paying attention and uh, forming this great conference. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, now we have a few minutes for questions. Someone has any questions? Hello. That was a great panel from everybody. That was really good. Um, my question to the temple people, because I came in a little bit late, so I may have missed it, but what is the, uh, are you guys already publishing this, or what is the goal, or where would you publish this data? We will see. Okay. <laughs> We don't know at this moment because the project is ongoing. Right. And after that, we will see where we can publish. We expect the, to publish in an impact uh, journey. But, bueno, we will see. We have the, all the permission of the ethical committee to, to make the study, and the results are, uh, we have a very large sample. The results are very interesting. So yeah, at the end of the, the data collection, we will see where, where uh, to publish it. Okay, Congra congratulations, thank you. Thank you to you. Congratulations, and are you using other plants? Están usando otras plantas porque están en un contexto de dieta. Y, y esa es la, sería la primera pregunta. Y la segunda, um, these guys, are they making a, a compromise to avoid using ayahuasca in the next 12 months or something, or are they using it frequently? So in the, in the temple, we, we don't do diets. Like we, we focus our work in ayahuasca. So we don't work with tobacco, we don't do other diets. So the, the, the guests that are coming are only working with, with ayahuasca in, in ceremonies. And you want to? And we are not going to 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 f forbid, forbid, for forbid uh, taking ayahuasca in, in the follow up for sure, but we are going to uh, collect the number of ayahuasca sessions that they do during the follow up because maybe the improvement in the results are related with the uh, number of ceremonies that they do uh, that they, they do in in their own countries or in the Temple of the Way of Light. Maybe it's interesting to select 
from all the participants, all these people who just uh, did ayahuasca in the Temple of the Way of Light and didn't uh, do more ceremonies. But we will see after when we analyze the, the, the data, uh, what is much more, um, bueno, because, what is the, the, the results? Because we, we don't know, but we are collecting this data to take it into account. Hi, my question is for Tanya. Um, do you screen out in your 20-minute Skype conversation, um, are there pre-existing mental disorders that you screen out? Yeah, there are some things that in the med forms and the psych forms are automatic. So there's a, there's a flagging system and you know, people with a previous history of psychotic outbreaks or bipolar diagnosis, especially recently, um, personality disorders, we screen those out. Uh, and I don't think that means it's an absolute contraindication for those people, but the way that the temple's currently set up uh, and the way that the research currently shows it, we can't take them right now. So it's more for the gray area stuff, people with high levels of anxiety or PTSD or this kind of thing, or maybe a family history of bipolar disorder. So just assessing their readiness, their trauma level, if the temple can support them currently. My question is for the temple people. What kind of therapeutic modalities do you use at the temple during integration and what kind of psychological techniques, if any, do you recommend for people afterwards to work with the eventual return of self-harming mental processes and deeply embedded core beliefs because the onus I think is too often on the plant medicine to do all the work of undoing decades of enculturation and internalized trauma. So what are the options for when people no longer have access to the medicinal tools or community? This is the question. <laughs> um, at the temple, uh, there, there's two different programs. So there's a, a shorter program that's either nine days or 12 days long. During that program, there's no psychological tools that are offered. There's sharing circles. It's much more traditional style. Um, sometimes when I'm working there, we do processing in the style of Gabor that's a bit more psychological, psycho-spiritual. Um, but generally, it's not psychological. The focus is on the plant healing. And at the end of those retreats, we give an integration talk and further resources for people to access once they're home. Uh, we're developing a continuing care program that consists of uh, 12 weeks worth of ayahuasca specific articles uh, to help people because there's not a lot of, of accessible writing out there uh, but I really think the important piece is talking to a real person so that's part of the work that I'm trying to encourage trying to do more of at the deep immersion side we have a three-week program where people do more ceremonies and there are art therapy classes and there's some CBT classes and just different kinds of psychological stuff depending on who's working there at the time. And then there's also yoga and meditation. Um, but the ongoing stuff, we really encourage people to reach out if they're having a problem and, and we can't guarantee that everybody will do that. Uh, so this, it's again, this is the question. Yeah, can I add something? So in the, in the one month program, uh, the goal of all the classes that we offer is give tools, no, giving tools to uh, for the people to process the material in the temple, no, but also giving tools for after the, the temple. And one of the most important things for me, at, at, at least, is um, give tools to be able to create silence inside in order to be able to listen, no, to listen of what is happening, because not only in ceremony, uh, in ce the ceremony is is important, but all the stuff that can come up after ceremony, it's also very important. And so create this, this space of silence inside to be able to listen. Thank you. Hi, so my name is David and um, I was really uh, stoked to hear everyone's sharing and uh, Tanya specifically, the work on the integration was excellent. And um, I'm studying community psychology among other things, um, as well as this this path of medicine. and what you said about if we if we had community we wouldn't need integration that really struck a resonant chord for me and um in my own interests and what i'd like to see evolve and i totally agree with that statement and i'd love to hear your um reflection on why is that the case uh first of all i got to give credit again to mark for that statement it's not mine but <laughs> I think, I mean, if you look at Western society, we're disconnected, we're alienated, and I think the disconnection from self, but the disconnection from other people, 
uh, because if you're disconnected from yourself, you can't actually authentically connect with another person is part of where all of chronic illness comes from. Uh, so finding ways to heal that, reconnect with ourselves, reconnect with nature, reconnect with the earth, uh, will automatically, naturally create more connection with other people. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yeah? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for the people of Benistar Um Could you tell the names of the groups where you collect the plants? Or, and uh, Because they seem to have different n names depending on the group. And don't you think this is an important information in terms of ethnobotanics and also to getting to know better the species? Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't remember now all the names of the groups, but I can I can say if you want, we can you can pass my your email. But is a lot of it, ten groups approximately. So I can I can show you if you want, but now I can't remember. Sorry. Question for people of the temple. People come to you, all kinds of people, they want to drink. Has it happened that they hide important mental health facts from you? It happens. <laughs> it happens. You can't, you can't guarantee honesty from everybody and you can't guarantee that people are going to disclose everything. There's, I don't think there's any screening process that's going to be 100% effective. Uh, so it happens and we do our best. Thank you guys very much for this great panel. Uh, question for Tanya. Um, I definitely agree around the idea that people can come and sort of become their true selves, but I did want to raise the idea that I think there is a culture to ayahuasca and the, med you know, the medicine and the way that we speak, and um, may maybe there are some expectations at a retreat center that you're going to heal and then speak a certain way and present yourself a certain way and so just to, to be reflexive of that we are also a culture and there could be aspects of people um, not necessarily becoming their true selves but the people they think they need to become in in the context that, that we are just any thoughts about that yeah i mean i don't know if uh, who knows when people reach the ultimate destination of their true self but hopefully they become truer versions of themselves and, and that is evidenced by increased levels of happiness and meaningfulness and well-being. Uh, and then part of, part of the way that I like to work is really encouraging people to speak in a language that reaches everybody. So not necessarily speaking in only medicine language that can be alienating for other people, uh, but speaking in a language that can, that can go back into the world and develop this community that I'm talking about. Um, at the same time, you know, developing a community and, and using the language of that community can be an important step in healing. So hopefully that's not the end goal to become uh, an ayahuasca person, or maybe it is, I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's my goal, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but still finding ways to be in the real world uh, and, and communicate with everybody, not just in language that, that feels good. Um, it's a question for the temple, and so congratulations. But I was very surprised you said that all the ceremonies were conducted by Shibibu Kunibu. I would like to know about the psychological well-being of those masters, because they are the ones who are conducting the ceremonies and who are coping with all the illnesses and the process. So I would like to have some kind of report about the psychological well-being of these masters. How do you integrate it into the study of community? Uh, something that we talk about at the temple sometimes is uh, traditionally in Shipibo culture, the work that the maestros are doing is, is working with brujeria and working with Daniel and taking darts out of people and doing potentially life-threatening work. And they come and work with some gringos and it's easy for them. <laughs> uh, it, it's lighter work and even though it's really difficult for us, they see somebody who's sad and, and it's not such deep work. Um, it's true that they live, the Shipibo Konibo people are based in the Ukayali River in Pucallpa, not in Iquitos, so they travel. Um, but in general, the people that we work with, the people that I've worked with, are wonderful and generous and caring and laughing constantly. Um, anything to add? Yeah, I think that when some of us, no, some of the guests uh, ask the maestros, ah, it's, this is happening in ceremony, I don't know, they look at you and they say, 
concentrate. You know, it's like all our problems for us are, uh, for them it's like breathe and concentrate. Stay, stay there, no? stay still, be, be strong, no? And what they, what they do a lot is like encouraging people they they like to encourage people not to to um, to yeah to cheer people up like yeah you can do with that we are here to help they are very um, yeah very open always yeah. and, one more and, and we do have one person on the ground she manages everything Deborah but she also has frequent meetings with all of the healers all of the maestros and maestros to make sure that their needs are being met uh, so it, we care a lot about their well-being we care a lot about how they're doing and we want to make sure that we're working together uh, and integrating our approach with their approach. Sorry, but the time is up. Only one question more. No questions? Thank you. Um, my question will be for Camilla and uh, the gentleman at the end. It's regarding uh, the uh, MAO inhibitors. Because obviously people who are interested in ayahuasca brew, um, it would be the, um, the, it's the ayahuasca vine contains MAO inhibitors in the, 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 see? Can you speak slower, please? I Sorry. Um, the MA, MAO inhibitors contained within, you, you call them lianas, within the ayahuasca vine. Is, it, is there any future research into the, the difference in MAO inhibitors? Well, in fact, I can't talk about that because I'm in the anatomy part, but there are five labs, as we said, and one of them is uh, working in the chemistry um, analysis, uh, toxicology, more precisely. So I think that when the work is published, then you will hear more about that, but unfortunately now we can't share anything with that because we don't know. Okay. Thank you for your attendance.